Hello, everyone, and welcome to another exciting episode of New Comic Book Late Night Live. I'm Captain Logan, and joining me, as always, is the wonderful Curious Low. Good evening. Good evening. We'll, we'll put on our evening voices. Good evening. <laughs> Tonight, Lo and I are going to, as we always do, count down our three favorite comic books from last week. We're going to tell you about the three books that we are most excited, uh, excited about for next week. We're going to talk about some other random things that we read. And uh, Lo, I, I know periodically I bring this up, but uh, I just can't believe how long we've been doing this together. And, what week are we uh, on the We are look. already week number 18. Whew. It's That's crazy. Wild. Uh, from live, thanks for being here. Good to see you. Uh, folks are already chatting in the comments. And if you want to uh, talk, ask us anything later on during the Q&A, uh, make sure and save your questions until we get to the end. Uh, but we will have a 10 or 15 minute open forum at the end to talk to you folks about what you, whatever you'd like us to talk about. And uh, we're going to go ahead and get straight into it. Uh, Lo, how many books did you have this week? Was it a slimmer uh, week like we thought it would be? Yes. I technically only had three that I've been ongoing reading, but I had uh, three number ones that I also picked up. Yeah. Okay, cool. I had a bigger week, so it'll be another one of those one of those uh, weeks where you'll, you'll have to just uh, bear with me as I ramble on about the other books that I read. Uh, but anyway, we'll get there here in a little bit. Uh, what would you like to go first or second? I'll go second. I feel like I always go first. You go first. Yeah, I always like to let my co-host take take the <laughs> take the lead. But yeah, I'll I'll uh, I, I can go ahead and start. Sure. Uh, so talking about books that came out last week, uh, my number three. Well, okay. Uh, actually, now that I'm looking at this, hold on, hold on. Let me let me switch things around because uh, the thing I just realized that the thing I put initially on top is weeks ago. So I'm not going to to make that my number three. I was going to say Supergirl Rebirth. Uh, that was a book that came out uh, two weeks ago that I missed. So I'll talk about this uh, here in a little bit. Uh, so my number three, which clearly I am now uh, really prepared to talk about, is Detective Comics number nine thirty nine. Uh, uh, this is written by, uh, what is this, James Tinney in the fourth uh, with art. Where are the credits in this book? Where are the credits <laughs> in this book? Uh, Barrows. I don't know his first uh, name right off, but I do like the art in this a lot. Um, okay, so this is uh, this is a book that I have been kind of unsure about uh, as, as it's been going along about just kind of the basic setup premise. Uh, I think overall it is written pretty decently and um, for this is uh, this is Batwoman's father who of course is a military man and, and, and she was uh, a military uh, person also. Um, he She kind of followed in his first footsteps for a while. Uh, he is kind of the big villain for this arc which was a big surprise in the second or third issue uh, and he has been militarizing this group of Batmen basically doing the Arkham Knight premise but having a reason that it's a military this time in a way we didn't really have that with Arkham Knight and and, uh, and uh, Batwoman is having to go up against him. And now we're getting some background and uh, learning about the, uh, the the family stuff with this. Um, I don't know if this is a reveal for the 52 and moving forward versions of these characters or if this was already the case. And I don't know if people are... Okay. Uh, or if it's going to bother people, I am interested in it. Uh, but but I don't know a lot about Batwoman and I didn't read a lot of the... Uh, what was it? Rucka, uh, the Rucka stuff. I think it was Rucka who did who did the, the early Batwoman run. Um, it's been so long now, and I, and again, I didn't read much of that anyway. Uh, but the, but I uh, the we we've got this uh, we've had this revelation. At least it was a revelation for me that I uh, that I, I that that Kate Kane is uh, Bruce Wayne's cousin, and that her father and Martha Wayne were brother and sister. And so this is all now like this big family affair. And uh, that adds a whole extra dimension to this whole thing that I wasn't expecting that's really interesting. Uh, the, so we get this, we get this background uh, where we see is children uh, at the the Wayne's funeral and her trying to console him and uh, there's a lot of parallels made f uh, uh, to Batman with her father where he he became uh, this military general and is doing everything he's doing because he doesn't want people to have to go through uh, what somebody that uh, I think it was his his his, uh, his wife I forget um, that that uh, he cared about uh, he, you know he doesn't want to anybody to go through what he had to go through when that person died, just like Batman and his 
parents. And uh, but of course, he is uh, the bad guy in this arc, and he has a very unjustifies the means kind of uh, kind of philosophy. And he thinks that he has to kill a bunch of people in order for other people to survive. It's kind of, it's, it's it's that kind of a story. And um, team more and more. Uh, there's some really neat stuff with Red Robin in this. Uh, I have to keep reminding myself that Tim Drake is Red Robin in this and not just a Robin because his suit's all, all that red and it's weird. We basically just took the old Red Robin suit from 52 away because it's well, it's not good. And we gave him kind of an old Tim Drake suit and then we put two R's on his chest instead of the one, and now he's, he's Red Robin still. Uh, but there is a, there's a funny, there's an amusing joke about his old uh, suit with, with, the, with the silly uh, feathers, where uh, Spoiler says that they're showgirl feathers, and I thought that was fantastic. Uh, he's got kind of a fling with Spoiler in this that, uh, that I'm digging a lot. And I like the panel layouts a lot in this. I uh, go, go into the artwork. Uh, first of all, I think the art in this uh, with faces, really super expressive. Uh, this is a guy who clearly uh, is, is really good at uh, drawing a lot of characters and making them all distinct uh, and giving them... Uh, uh, you know, looks that are all their own and making them very expressive. Uh, here's my favorite two-page uh, panel layout. I love this. We've been doing this a lot lately with uh, with bat uh, signals and putting multiple panels in them, and I never get tired of that. That's always super fun. Uh, and I like uh, I like Clayface's role in this so far, and that has been making more sense than I thought it would. Uh, but yeah, um, this is not the best thing I'm reading, but uh, I'm liking it a lot more than I thought I would, and um, I have stayed on it longer than I thought I would. Uh, it's also one of the books that's doing a better job of getting enough done in one issue in being double shipped every month. So that's really good. Lo, what was your number three? My number three is one of the ones that was not on my initial uh, pull list, but I picked it up just because of recent events. I got the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers 2016 Annual Number One, um, and the only Power Rangers book I've been reading is Pink. Um, so Please I wasn't sure. Crap. Is that yours? Yeah, that is my number two, and I did not think that you were even going to pick that up. I mean, I picked it up on a whim. I only had three books in my poll, and I was like, I'm new to Power Rangers. It's an annual, so I know it's going to be at least semi-one-shot, even if it is sort of a continuation of a story. I so am, I picked it up. I'm so excited you picked that, because <laughs> I wanted to spend a little bit of time with this, and uh, we'll, we'll get to talk about it a little bit. Sorry, go, go ahead. Yeah. Um, you'll probably have a lot more to say about it than I will, just because I am so new to the characters, and uh, like, I'm not going to get every little like callback and stuff, but... Yeah. I actually did understand a lot of it, and I was kind of proud of myself. <laughs> um, and I loved, I loved the fact that, and this is not something that I've like, I've certainly seen stuff like this before. But I always enjoy it when there's different short stories in something, and they do different art styles um, for each short story. Um, I really liked how Trini's was anime, <laughs> um, and I don't know. And it's just. There was a lot of zany stuff going on in this, and you guys know me. That's a very me thing to gravitate towards. So I quite liked it. I'm more interested to hear what Cap has to say about it and then maybe springboard off of him because that's what I have to say. It was fun, and I liked the art. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I picked this second because of eight pages, and I imagine, Lo, you will know what eight pages I am talking about. Does it have a little something to do with our favorite school bullies? No, no, no. certainly not. No, okay. it has something to do with our oh, favorite no, no, lord, my favorite villain. Lord wow. Zed, yeah. How could I have ever? And it's uh, not, but you gotta understand, it's not just because Zed's in it. I, uh, oh my sure. god, is no, no, no. It's so good. <laughs> uh, here's the thing. So, so I'll talk about this overall, and then, and then I'll, and then I'll spend a little bit of time on those eight pages because. Uh, and, and again, you're not going to believe me because you spent a weekend with me where we talked uh, like like 60% Power Rangers the whole time. <laughs> and uh, and and like like I know you won't believe me, but I am so impressed with this because uh, I see a lot of people these days not using comic book real estate to their advantage and treating the medium like if you don't get several issues, you can't tell any story. And uh, the whoever did the I got I got to look this up. Uh, but whoever did the uh, the Lord Zed Goldar story in the middle of this Ray understands Moore. this. Yeah, really understands uh, the the comic medium and knows how to get a lot done in in, in very little space. Um, so my uh, 
there were there were a couple throwaway things in in this that uh, I didn't really uh, get a lot out of, uh, and you know some of these stories only got four, five, six pages, and um, were kind of just sketches before they were anything. Um, Power Rangers is a thing you can do that in, uh, so like it, it didn't bother me that we didn't get you know a lot of great stories in this. Um, although the the Jason story at the beginning uh, that's just like a day in the life of kind of thing, and he is stretched too thin. Um, I felt like was a was a premise for for a, for the beginning of a story before it was a story, and it didn't really get anywhere. Um, I was like, this is this is a, a really good six or seven pages for another comic book, and then we just it just ends. Uh, the the Balkan Skull story is hilarious, and I was shocked that it wasn't a dream sequence. I kind of uh, forgot about the Lord Zed one, and I know you're going to want to fly back out here and smack me but <laughs> no no not at all but i had just forgotten about that that one i was like flipping through the pages like seeing all the different ones and that one popped out at me but yeah the lord said one is obviously your favorite um, uh, but also not being um not being as into this property as me uh th th I, I can see why it wouldn't stand out to you as much um but yeah i'll go ahead and, i'll go ahead and talk about that so um that story is everything I want the main Power Rangers comic to be. Like, I want them to get that book and or to get their own book. Um, what we did, what we're doing with that is we're taking the iconography and the lore of Power Rangers and we're making it make sense and we're doing really creative origin stuff with it. So uh, it's, it's Goldar and a brother we didn't know about who are working for Lord Zed. And this is, by the way, the only story in this that I think has a lot of substance as far as um, ideas and thematic stuff. Uh, it's, it's all about uh, power and it's all about um, the, the uh, might makes right philosophy and why that falls apart. And of course, handled in uh, a way more um, in 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 a you know a way more intelligent way than uh, th that show would have ever been able to deal with it. And uh, the the idea is that Goldar and his brother Silverback, uh, I love that. He's got a brother named Silverback, and they are. Uh, the kind of the uh, right hand men of Lord Zed, and he sends them out to do his dirty work for them, or to do, uh, yeah, his, his dirty work. And uh, this is basically setting up Mighty Morphin. So Zed has, and I don't know how much of this you picked up on, Lope, but but uh, but Zed has sent Rita Repulsa to the moon because uh, Zordon is on his way to Earth and about to select Power Rangers. And he picks Goldar and his brother, or init initially both of them, uh, in, in, to go do that instead of to go take over Eltar. Because Eltar is now, like, ripe for conquest. And they think that Zed has lost his mojo and that he's not as powerful as he used to be. And with their philosophy, the person who is most powerful is the person that should lead. So if he's starting to uh, kind of fall apart and get more weak, then they should take him down and take over and silverback wants to do that and then lord zed proves that he's still a lot more powerful than they think he is and uh, i really i really like this idea because it's like it's like uh if you have you know it's like it's like the golden the golden rule whoever has the most gold makes the rules so lord zed uh is not uh, physically as powerful as he used to be, but he has other kinds of power, and he's and even if his strategies don't make sense, uh, and you kind of get the the sense that maybe it's all about a vendetta before it's anything else. So like they're right, the strategy they should be going for is go take over Eltar, but uh, what he is, but uh, he is like obsessed with taking down Zordon, and so it's kind of setting up the reason that you have a silly formula in that show where it's always the same thing over and over again. And I love that about it. Um, there's, there are some things in this that remind me of what I always wanted to do with Power Rangers if I were to write it myself and take that, take that lore and do something more sophisticated with it. Um, there's a lot of other really neat things in it, but I mean, it's eight pages and it gets so much accomplished. Uh, so yeah, um, I'm, I'm picking that mostly on that story. Uh, like I said, the Vulcan and Skull story is funny. They, 
the Power Rangers are uh, off. Uh, they, they've been captured, and Bulk and Skull have to become Power Rangers. And uh, Skull or, or uh, Bulk gets a Zord called the Baconodon. He's a bacon Zord, and it's hilarious. And then you get to the end, and it's not a dream, and they actually did it, and they wiped their, they wiped everybody's memories or something so that people wouldn't know that Vulcan Skull became Power Rangers. And it's absolutely ludicrous, but it's really funny. Anyway, uh, but yeah, well, I was stoked that you picked that, because we're after Morphicon, and you're still reading Power Ranger things. Woo! I mean, granted, this is the first thing, I think, that's come out since Power Morphicon that I've picked up, but... At, like I know about it now, so I might as well like continue to yeah. enjoy things. I put all that time and effort into watching the show. <laughs> oh, I also meant to mention that that uh, that thing is chock full of and not too much fan service, like references that make sense. But like, yes, th th that eight pages is chock full of uh, of 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 really cool Power Ranger references. Like like uh, it's all about trying to get. Is Ed trying to get his hands on the Zeo crystal? And uh, there's talk about Dark Spectre and stuff. Um, yeah, it's neat. Anyway. All right. Well, that was your number two, correct? That was my number two, yeah. Okay. So I'll go ahead and go on to my number two. My number two was Wonder Woman number five, um, which continues the, the lies half of her storyline because it's been the every other. Um, Still, this one continues to be my favorite of the two storylines, uh, which is the one that's taking place in the jungle. This spent a lot of time with the prisoners, and this continues to have gorgeous art. And I feel like that's always the first thing I talk about, but I don't know. I'm a visual person. I like art. Um, and while certainly the art in both storylines is great, I just think that the jungle lends itself really well to gorgeous art. But even just some of the stuff that's happening not there, like... I don't know, like, some of that is just so pretty. Um, and I'm still really hooked on this storyline, which for somebody who has been basically picking comics because, hey, I've heard of that character or that cover looks cool, like, I, I'm i very hit and miss on what comics I buy, um, like, because I just don't have the history to be like, oh, yeah, I really like this author or that author. Um, this one is just been holding my interest very well and very consistently since issue one um, and continues to do so. And I'm like excited to pick it up every week. So yeah, still really enjoying this one. What about you, Cap? Uh, I got that too. I didn't put it on my list this week. I didn't like it as well as three. Uh, I got, I got a different cover. I got the other cover or oh. the other, other covers. Um, but I got the art didn't uh, impress me as much as it did last time. Maybe, maybe that's just because, you know that that it jumped out at me before, and now I'm kind of accustomed to it. But like, yeah. we didn't we didn't get any of that really awesome landscape stuff like we got in light. And I thought that in a few places, uh, some of the facial expressions were a little weird. This one, I, I will agree with you. This one was a little weird to me. Yeah, I couldn't I couldn't deal with that. <laughs> yeah, that is one of the things that immediately took it off my top three. Uh, was but I love like expression. like look at this one. I don't know. I think that that's yeah. just such a gorgeous like. It's only one page, but I don't know. I like the castle in the background. But maybe that's you know, just me being a huge fantasy nerd. I'm still certainly invested in this arc. You know what? You know what my thing with this issue was. I just kept wanting to get back to Wonder Woman and Cheetah. Like any time we moved away from them, I stopped caring. See, I was like, very interested in everything that was happening with everybody that's imprisoned. I was like, I was all about like figuring out what's going down with them because I still feel. Like, we don't really know everything that's happening there. Whereas, like, yeah. I understand what's happening with Wonder Woman and Cheetah. So, while I still really like them, I'm more like, ooh, intrigued. Uh, so, on to number ones, then. Uh, my number one for this week uh, was a big shocker for me because uh, I got to give this lead in real quick. I did not originally intend on buying this issue because I don't usually read this book, and this isn't a character I, I, I check in and out here and there. Uh, but my uh, my comic shop owner this week, William, he put the, it, for some reason, he put this in my in my pull list. And uh, I went in on Sunday, and I talked to a different person that works there, and not him. And uh, I initially, I pulled this out. And I was like, oh, I don't put that on my, on my pull. And uh, the guy looked at me, and he said, okay, but you might want to get it anyway, because he knows that I review. He was like, you might want to get it anyway, because for whatever reason, that issue sold out super crazy fast, and it's really popular this week. And I was like, all right, 
I'll read it. I don't know if I'll have any idea where I'm at or what's going on. And then it ends up being my number one this week. It is International Iron Man number six. This is uh, written by, by uh, Brian Michael Bendis with art by a really great uh, uh, kind of sketchy and um, and uh, you know grounded art by uh, Alex Believe. Um, I don't. I almost don't want to say hardly anything about this. Uh, I think people just need to read this. This is a thing that is easy to read without having read any of the rest of this book uh, because it, see, I don't even know if I want to say that much about it. Uh, uh, it's, it has things to do with what's been going on in this book apparently, but when you pick it up and just start reading, it looks kind of like a first issue uh, and you don't even know who these characters are and it's very introductory. And then at the end, it reveals who exactly you're looking at and what's been going on. So I'll give you the basic gist of the setup for this story without saying anything else, because I was like entranced with this because it's just really good storytelling before I had any idea what was going on. I, uh, or not what was going on, but, but why this was relevant to Iron Man. So the point where there's a character that shows up that I think is Tony Stark that turns out not to be Tony Stark and that's on purpose. Um, so, you have a girl who is a uh, who, who's a, a, a singer, and she sings in uh, kind of like dives, and she she seems to she seems to be singing like uh, you know really uh, alternative or uh, like out there heavy metal type stuff, and she thinks her uh, her her music is awful, uh, but she but she wants to make it like she's just she's just a really harsh critic on herself, and a shield agent shows up and uh, offers her a record deal and tells her that uh, she is uh, uh, like prime S.H.I.E.L.D. agent material and that if she becomes a S.H.I.E.L.D. agent uh, as her cover, she'll get to be a, uh, she'll, she'll get her own records and get to tour on the road and she'll be famous and she'll be hiding in plain sight and wherever she goes on her tour, which of course S.H.I.E.L.D. is sending her on purpose, then she'll be also doing S.H.I.E.L.D. agent stuff. And so she gets to live her dream, but she has to pay for it by being a S.H.I.E.L.D. agent. And uh, it was a really good character piece. And like I said, I was totally sucked into it. And then when you get to the end and you find out what exactly it is you're reading, it's... Um, I don't want to say it's more intriguing because it's just a really it's like like just a really good short story. Like I would have liked this just in prose, having nothing to do with comic books. And um, but then you find out you know why it's relevant, and you're like, okay, that's why I'm looking at this. Awesome. Uh, but yeah, so something of a cryptic review. Boy, this is good stuff, and some of the best Bendis I've read in a while. What was your nice. number one? Well, yeah, my number one. I was reading that book for a while, and I dropped it. I don't really remember why. I just know that I read a few issues, and then I stopped. So maybe I'll pick up that issue, and maybe I'll start reading again. Who knows? Um, <laughs> so my number one, and I always hate when I do this, and it's like the same books every week. But like, I ain't gonna lie to you guys. This was my number one. Squirrel Girl it's number right eleven. <laughs> Squirrel Girl number eleven or as it was called on here, 001011, because this entire issue was all about coding, um, which I thought was pretty cool, just like computer science stuff, which uh, she is a student, um, and that's what she's studying. So of course she's going to know all about that. Um, and it had to do with Doc Ock and Venom and a whole myriad of different villains, although those two were definitely the biggest ones. Um, and she she beat these villains with uh, with math, and yeah, exactly. Bobby <laughs> Singer just said just said in the comments, um, Su Squirrel Girl number eleven teaching you how to count to thirty one on one hand, which it That's totally hilarious. did. Um, yeah, it was it was really fun. In I mean, like classic Squirrel Girl, just kind of like very nuts. Haha, <laughs> no pun intended. Um, and uh, yeah, I just like the fact that she was able to beat some supervillains with uh, computer science. I like that idea. And I continue to like this. And the guy who writes this, uh, Ryan North, his Twitter is amazing. I follow him, and if you don't, you should too, because he's hilarious. And he tweets a lot of really funny things. Anyways, that was neither here nor there. Scroll to number, number 11 was good. <laughs> You got through that without adorable. I know, and I also didn't say quirky, but I almost did. 
I tried really hard <laughs> to contain the words that I always say. Well, Lo, uh, even though you uh, or I ended up going first, I'm going to have you go ahead and do your uh, other books uh, now because you have fewer of them than I do, and I'm going to take a little while. So, and because uh, I'm me, and we'll take like 30 seconds. <laughs> well, I mean, I I wasn't going to say it. Uh, <laughs> I said it. <laughs> but yeah, uh, so what what else did you read this week, Lo? I also picked up Deathstroke number one, um, which I liked. I'm not very familiar with the character. Basically, what I know, I know from Arrow, which from what I know of Arrow is probably not a good representation of the character, but who knows. Um, so I was just interested in it because of that. Um, I'm sort of neutral on it. It was interesting, but I was a little confused. But, I mean, that's basically my comic book life um, <laughs> is being like, this is cool, but I'm not sure how much of this is supposed to be like, this is the beginning of a story and you're not supposed to know what's going on and how much of it is like, if you have background, right? Like I'm going to get it better. Um, but I still liked it. I thought it was pretty good. Um, really liked the cover as well. Got Deadpool number 17, which is one that like, I always really enjoy, but Deadpool is never like, like so amazing. And like, Oh, like twists and all these things. Like I was just kind of like it for a good chuckle. And, um, and stuff, which it continues to be. There was lots of, lots of fighting in this one, as opposed to all the other Deadpool issues where there's no fighting. And then I got uh, Suicide Squad number one, um, and I just also picked this up off the shelf on a whim, um, just because it came out this week, and I figured I would try it, especially since I just finally saw Suicide Squad this last weekend, and I wanted to sort of compare it. Um, and I'm sure that this is completely a marketing thing. I was sort of confused as to why, and granted, I did read this one first, so I could be wrong here, but I remember it being more about Deadshot than it was about Harley Quinn. So this is probably just a marketing thing to have her front and center. But, uh, but I was confused by that. <laughs> but I liked it. I remember really liking it. I honestly, for the life of me, it was like a few hours ago that I read it because I read all of these today. Um, I can't quite remember what the plot was at the moment, <laughs> but I do remember enjoying it. <laughs> yeah. Those were my other three. That's all that I had. Um, I don't know who drew that cover. That's a really good looking cover. Let's find out. Oh, well, maybe, maybe. Or let's not find out. They're going to make me look for it. Um, yeah, I, I heard awful things about the, uh, about the lead-in issue, the rebirth issue, and so I didn't, I didn't try that. But, because uh, I was curious, because I was like, okay, maybe taking, because of course, you know, they took all the characters from the movie and put them in a book together. And that's mm -hmm. not what Suicide Squad usually is. Uh, it, it, was just, it was kind of a, it was, it, their, their own assortment of characters, some of which have been on Suicide Squad before, you know, just put a, put a weird mix together. And uh, I thought, well, maybe somebody will take that and do cooler things with it and uh, come before him. And um, I heard awful things, but I haven't tried it myself, so I don't know. Wait, the, uh, the cover was by Lee Williams and Sinclair. Oh, okay. There you go. Cool, thanks. Anyway. You're welcome. Uh, all right, I, I, uh, I'm gonna go down. Sorry, I just totally derailed this apparently. Uh, <laughs> I'll go down with some of my other books briefly. As I said, I finally got my hands on Supergirl Rebirth. Uh, this is a really interesting new status quo for Supergirl. Uh, and I don't know what I think of it yet, but I overall I enjoyed this a lot. Enough that I would have put it uh, third on my, on my list this week had it come out this week. Uh, this basically takes the 52 Supergirl who has not really had much of a secret identity uh, and gives her the, finally, the, the Linda Danvers secret identity and tries to sort of blend something akin to the TV show status quo with this very different version of Supergirl that we've had with 52 uh, versus the one that we have in the TV show. Uh, she's, she's just a really different character. Uh, and she's, and we've seen like glimpses of this as a side to the Kara in the TV show, but this character comes to earth and is just plain angry. And for a while, because her planet exploded and she's stuck on Earth and she doesn't like Earth and she has every reason not to like Earth and she kind of solves all of her problems with her fists for a while and stuff and she's mellowed out a lot now but the U.S. government still doesn't totally trust her and they have good reasons for that 
And we have introduced the DEO, which is in the TV show, and we've got National City, which I don't love, but we're, do we're doing a lot of this TV show stuff, uh, I guess. And I understand why we do this, you know, so that folks that are reading comics that are also really into that show might give Supergirl a chance and feel at home because uh, there's more stuff that they recognize. It's blended pretty well so far with what we have with this character already. And the initial uh, first story that opens this is very much a story that feels kind of right out of that show where we have uh, an, an old Kryptonian who was uh, trapped in the Phantom Zone who is played as an antagonist but is a sympathetic antagonist and you kind of feel for him a little bit. And in this case, it's a Kryptonian werewolf, uh, which is sort of fun. And he is... He was thrown in the Phantom Zone by Zor-El, uh, Supergirl's father, because... He had this horrible illness, and he was going to affect everybody, and Zarel didn't know what to do except throw him in the Phantom Zone, which is awful and super sad. And uh, he, he ends up being pulled back out uh, in present day here, and like I said, he's, he's pretty sympathetic, and um, you know, I, I enjoy the story overall. At the end, there's kind of a big, sort of a reveal for Zarel, which is weird because, and I'll just give this away because it's not news, really. Uh, they're they're playing it like when they finally bring up that he's Cyborg Superman again, that it's going to be a big reveal, which I guess for anybody that hasn't, that wasn't reading 50 G Supergirl, they wouldn't know that. But it's weird that we see this kind of, we see this close up on his face where it's like he's sort of cyborg-y. And it's like they're, they're going to they're gonna maybe play the fact that he's Cyborg Superman as a huge reveal. I was like in the second story arc of 52 Supergirl. Like, this is not news. We know this. I don't think Kara knows this, so it'll be news to her. But it's a little weird the way they're playing that. Uh, Ghostbusters International number eight. So I decided that this is not a miniseries. I didn't realize this was a monthly. I've been reading this this whole time, waiting for it to end. And I guess, I guess for whatever reason, IDW, after they canceled the monthly Ghostbusters book, decided to give it not too long after that another monthly, and that's what this is. Uh, this this went this went for a total curveball, uh, and I'm still really liking this. Where we took last issue, we had. Egon get trapped in, we think trapped in another dimension. We don't really know what happened to him, but there's a ghost that takes him. And uh, the, the, the Ghostbusters are trying to find him and figure out uh, if he's still alive or not. And uh, and, Vink, and Vinkman, even for Vinkman, is too flippant about that. That is one thing that I will complain about, is I was surprised by just how uh, nonchalant and jokey he was about the fact that Egon may have disintegrated. And uh, what ends up happening is they go to, they go back to the uh, real Ghostbusters dimension, and they go get that Egon, the cartoon Egon, in order to help them find regular Egon. And uh, I've never really liked the idea of the real Ghostbusters just being un in another dimension because of how much from that show we're borrowing already. Uh, but in this case, it was pretty funny, and I really enjoyed it. And um, I'm starting to see more of how there's enough differences between those dimensions that we can play them as different dimensions. Uh, and there's a cartoon ghost that is... Uh, making a big deal out of how different the cartoon ghosts are from the regular Ghostbusters ghosts. And uh, she's actually kind of mortifying, and it's hilarious. Uh, Action Comics, number 962. We're still not getting enough done in an issue, but finally we're done with the Doomsday fight. Took six issues, but the Doomsday fight is over. Finally! Uh, there was no reason for it to take as long as it did. Uh, Superman's answer for this is... A, a little obvious, and B, seems disingenuous. I'll just throw this out there. I don't think anybody's going to mind my spoiling this. He throws Doomsday in the Phantom Zone. So, um, is he just going to kill all the people that are in the Phantom Zone now? Like, that doesn't seem like a good idea to me, uh, unless it's the kind of Phantom Zone where... Because I'm, I'm fuzzy on what the Phantom Zone is in 52. So, like, if it's a barren wasteland where Doomsday can run around and kill everyone, that's bad. If it's uh, if it's like a dimension where you're stuck and you can't really see each other and talk to each other, then maybe it's okay. Uh, but I thought that was kind of strange. Uh, and they're finally making a big deal out of how we're going to finally next issue find out what the heck Clark Kent is. Maybe. You know, that other Clark Kent that we have not been... Oh my god, it's just, it's just molasses, this book. It's molasses! Uh, Venom Space Knight, number 11. Uh, first time we got to see Venom and Spider-Man fight in a really long time, and that was kind of fun, uh, but it reminded me that uh, because of One More Day, yeah, we're still dealing with that after all these years, uh, Venom still doesn't remember 
that he was that that uh, Peter Parker was a symbiote, and that whole thing is weird and wonky and loopy, and we're having to deal with that again. Uh, this was mostly a big action-heavy issue; not a whole lot happens in it, uh, and I wasn't. I didn't really like how headstrong and jumping right into things Spider-Man was in, in the way he fights Venom in this. Uh, but the action's good, and it was kind of fun. It was kind of fun to see it, uh, and I like the cliffhanger a lot. Um, X Files number five was surprisingly good. There's some there's some neat backstory. I kind of wish this was in the TV show, but there's there's some uh, neat backstory for. Um, for Scully about her father and um, it's, uh, you know, it's X-Files. It's super creepy. Um, I won't say too much else uh, about it. I didn't love the art this issue, um, but uh, I did like what it did for, uh, for, for uh, Scully's history and how that's integrated into a story now with somebody who's kind of hallucinating things that her father went through. And finally, Ninja Turtle 61. Um, I'm not in love with this arc so far, I gotta say, uh, but uh, this issue I liked a lot more than the last issue, uh, dealing with Splinter's kind of moral ambiguity. I'm glad we're finally getting back to that after a long time. Uh, and I mean, it's been there in the background because he's running the Foot Clan, and they are still very much the Foot Clan, but uh, we're dealing a lot with the fact that he's starting to talk too much like the Shredder. Not that he's turning into the Shredder, but just that he cares more about uh, like battle strategy than he does about protecting people, and uh, he's more the leader of a cult and of a gang than he is a team of superheroes, and that's really problematic. Um, there are just kind of too many characters in this book right now, and like like uh, Tom Waltz always does a really good job of giving everybody a different voice and making them all very distinct, but there's just so many people I'm having to keep track of, it's getting a little bit harder to read month to month than it was before. Um, he never loses threads. He's always keeping track of everything. I imagine... I just imagine Tom Waltz's office being like nothing but a big giant wall of like all these characters and threads tied between them all so that you can keep track of these people. Uh, he's like a showrunner of a TV show, this guy. And uh, he's doing a really good job of keeping it all straight. I'm just not as interested as I have been in the past. Uh, and now we go on to cover of the week. Well, what was your favorite cover for last week? My favorite cover. Where'd it go? It's just talking about it. And even though I wasn't like super into the comic, I kind of really liked this cover. I like the, I've always been a big fan of orange and blue. I don't know why. Um, <laughs> so like this drew my eye um, and I don't know. I like the like sniper sights and stuff. So this was my favorite cover. Woo! What about you? There was not a cover that just jumped out at me this week. Everything's pretty kind of, Run of the mill, I think. Uh, but the uh, the Venom Spider Man cover is pretty classic uh, Venom Spider Man stuff, and um, it's it's nice and dynamic. So that'll be my pick for this week. And now we go on to our anticipated books for this coming week. Uh, the first person I saw who made a guess at something that is on my list, and there wasn't anybody from before with yours, Lo, because the only one that somebody said on yours was one that I know you didn't put this week because you told yeah. me about it. Yep. <laughs> uh, but, um, but Ultron 32 mentioned Silver Surfer number six, and that is on my list. Uh, that is the so uh, congratulations, Ultron, Ultron 32, and I think you know the drill, but make sure to send me a message, either a personal message either on Geek Pollution on Facebook or on YouTube, and uh, let me know what Marvel book from this week you'd like to post, and I'll send it right your way. Uh, Silver Surfer number six is the 50th anniversary issue, and it is uh, Silver Surfer number 200, even though, you know, we renumber all the time. So collectively put them all together, and they're saying it's issue number 200. Um it's uh, it's supposed to be a big, giant, major anniversary issue, and I love that book, so I'm quite excited about it. Uh, and we had a great cliffhanger last issue, so so um, so I'm I'm looking forward to it. Uh, TMNT Universe number one is the second thing on my list. That is uh, the the first of a new uh, second ongoing monthly Ninja Turtle series, and I'm really excited about that uh, with with a new creative team. Uh, the cover for it is absolutely gorgeous, and uh, it's apparently a story where the Ninja Turtles have to begrudge. Uh, go try to save Baxter Stockman from some new mutant. And then uh, I also put X-Files Origins number one on this list. Uh, we're going to have a series that goes back and uh, explains how Mulder and Scully became F FBI agents in the first place. And I don't know if that's going to be any good, but I'm looking forward to the first issue. Uh, what are your anticipated books, Lo? My top three are Han Solo number three, Rough Riders number five, and Gotham Academy number one, Annual. 
I'm very excited for that because it's our first annual. As far as hand solo <laughs> goes, um, we've all, I don't know, I think we've all been sort of enjoying that, even if it's not like yeah. the best book. It's all right. I, 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 I still can't get over the fact that I wasn't in love with issue number one, but I really liked two. So I'm kind of like, I don't know. I don't know. I'm excited for it. I guess I'm more intrigued than excited for Han Solo. Rough Riders is a uh, book that I've been sort of mentioning here and there. It's written by Adam Glass, um, who's used to be one of the main writers on Supernatural. Um, and obviously, he's done a lot of comic stuff. But um, that's where I know him from. Um, and it's basically steampunk American heroes kicking butt. So I like it. And then you guys all know I love Gotham Academy and... I'm excited because I have not been loving the crossover of Gotham Academy and Lumberjanes, which is weird because I really like both books individually, but I don't know. I just haven't been loving the crossover, so I'm excited to get some like true Gotham Academy stuff again. Cool. So uh, you have those things to look forward to us talking about next week. Probably, uh, you know, unless some of those things suck, and then you'll hear us uh, very quickly brush them off as things that were not that good. And now we go on to this week's open forum for the next 10 or 15 minutes. We're going to talk to you folks about whatever you'd like us to talk about. So be sure and start leaving your comments and questions in the, uh, in the comment section there on the YouTube page. And I uh, will talk about superheroes and sci-fi and uh, pop culture stuff. Anything you guys are interested uh, in us talking about as soon as we start seeing Interesting things. Uh, Ultron 32, did either of you read Blue Beetle? No, I didn't. I've just never been big into that character, and I really didn't care that much. So if I heard awesome things, I would check it out, but um, I didn't pick it up immediately. Um, Brother Antilles, uh, Cap, I've gotten super into X-Files again as of late. Is the current book worth reading? When does it take place? So it is between it's it, it's it's, uh, it's stuff that happens like right before the event series, uh, and it's supposed to be kind of in that current continuity. Um, unfortunately, we've sort of wiped season uh, eight, season nine and ten off the map. Uh, but th 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 so these things aren't so this isn't building on that stuff. Uh, but it's kind of just more X Files stories. Uh, so, like, if you know that series at all, it's very easy to jump in and read. And it's the same, it's mostly the same creative team that we had before uh, that was really, really good. So it's kind of the same book. It's just not dealing with any of what we were dealing with before. Uh, and since you probably haven't been reading that stuff, um, it, it would be really easy for you to pick up and read. So, so yeah. <laughs> I'm, like, trying to find comments. Uh, will Leonardo DiCaprio ever be in a superhero film from Barry Allen? Well, I don't know. I'd have to ask his age. Um, <laughs> uh, no, I can totally see it. Um, I don't think he's anti that necessarily, unless somebody knows about an interview that he where he said that he wouldn't do that. Um, I don't know. Right off, I'm not. I'm not a big fan casting guy. I don't. I don't know. Right off, where I'd put him if you wanted to be in something. He's, he's one of those guys that just doesn't age. Yeah, that's for sure. He's like Tom Cruise. I just ooh. I have an opinion on this. Um, so it's yeah. so thoughts on Donald Glover possibly playing Lando in the Han Solo movie. I actually would not like that. I love Donald Glover. I think he's great. Um, but I feel like he is everybody's fan cast for everything. And I'm a little sick of it. <laughs> that, that and Michael B. Jordan. Uh, he, yeah. Like, Michael B. Jordan has that too. Uh, to the point where people are fan cast, keep trying to fan cast him in Marvel things, and we keep having to remind people that he already got a role. Hey, you know, Captain America was also in a Fantastic Four movie, so, or two. So. No, no, that's, no, no, that's not what I mean. He's, he's going to be in Black Panther. Oh, like I didn't people, know that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's in Black Panther, and people keep trying to guess other things that he should be, and I'm like, no, no, he's already in the Marvel movies. He can't be another character in the current Marvel movies. Yeah. I did not know that he was cast in that. I think he'll be great. But yeah, with Donald Glover, I mean, I guess it's just been such a long time that people have been like, he needs to play Spider-Man for like, it, probably like almost 10 years now. It's been a long time that... Because it was pre the Amazing Spider-Man uh, that that whole thing started, and I don't know. I, I just I would like to see somebody else other than Donald Glover. I don't know. I just feel I feel strongly that I don't want him to be cast as that <laughs> for like no reasons that I can explain. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, I, I don't have an opinion. Uh, yeah, I, that's why I said I have one. I wasn't sure if you would. No, I'm glad you answered that because I really don't have an opinion on that. Yeah, and I and I don't have any other good ideas of who if, of who could play him right now. So I don't know. Uh, Bobby Singer, Cap. I've been talking about this with my brother a lot. Who do you think is the true heir to the cowl? In my eyes, Tim and Cassandra together are the future of Batman. I don't know. Um, I'm always weird about that. J- just as just as a Batman fan in a with a you know serialized narrative where we perpetually keep characters younger, uh, I don't get real excited about other people being Batman. Uh, I just you know I just want Batman to be Bruce Wayne most of the time, uh, and that's not to say that I'm not open minded and I'll read other things when we do them. Um, I like I like certain bits of Dick Grayson as Batman, and some people are just super anti that and don't like it at all, no matter what we do with it. Um, and Gordon as Batman had his moments, but I didn't, I didn't love that idea either. Uh, but as far as like who the heir to the cow would be, like, like, like if Batman, if this were real life, Batman actually died, who, who, who should it be? It's still hard for me not to say Dick Grayson. I mean, I still, I still feel like he's, he's kind of, he's kind of most worthy of it. And, uh, next to Batman seems to be the, uh, uh you know, maybe not, maybe he, he's not as good of a detective as, as, as Tim Drake, but he seems to be, uh, you know, of the, of that physical prowess and capable of a lot of those things that Batman is so it's um I don't know it's hard not to think that that's still the guy uh and then the cop out answer is uh Bruce Wayne gets elderly and then it's Terry McGinnis uh yeah the idea of Tim and Cassie taking over is interesting sure um but like you know that would still be a Batman and a Batgirl or just two people that are of different you know wearing different costumes, calling themselves different things, taking over for Batman. And in that case, you could just say the whole Bat family. Like, the idea of the idea of two different people taking over for Batman is weird when you have a whole group of people that fight together in Gotham City. So I wouldn't have really thought about it like that. I mean, it seems like a mantle um, that, you know, is reserved for a man because it's called man. And then that guy would put it on. And then you would also have Bat girls or Bat women that would also help fight, you know, bad guys in Gotham City. There was something that I saw, and I won't be able to answer this just because I don't have anything that would fit this bill. But um, what comic storylines had the greatest emotional and or intellectual impact on you? Oh, geez, man. I mean, like, there's there's open form questions, and then there's essay questions. <laughs> Uh, like, man, g- give me give me some time and let me let me let me write my five hundred to a thousand words in a blue book. Um. Right off the top of my head, emotional impact. The first thing that that comes to my mind um, always with this is Marvels. Uh, that's that's my, that's one of my my big ones. Um, and I would need some more time to think and noodle things that I've read over the years beyond that. But that's 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 my first immediate answer. What was the rest of the question? You said that was it. Just what's a comic that's had an emotional or I think the other word was or intellectual, what, intellectual impact. Yeah. Oh, okay. Just or yeah, that just made you think a lot. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, in in your in your brief history with comics, do you have one that jumps out at you immediately like that? No. I, like I partly is just that I'm so new to the medium that it's harder for me to like actually like get into a, a book and let it I, I don't know how to describe this like because I'm so new to comics like when I'm reading them it's harder for me to just get lost in the comic the way I do with reading or a movie because I'm very used to them and that's not to say that comics can't get me there eventually but if you hand Romeo and Juliet to somebody who's you know, never read anything past hop on pop. Like they're not, I don't know, like it would, you have to work there and get to the point that you understand how things work in that medium before you can understand it. And I still feel like I'm at the point where, and that's probably part of the reason why I tend to go for books that are a little bit more silly is just that I can get that very easily um, as opposed to something that's a little bit more emotional and deep that I still can't quite get sucked into comics the way that I'm sure I will eventually. Um, but yeah, I just sure. haven't quite yeah. got there and I've read Marvels. I loved it. I thought it was great, but it's still a medium that I'm not super familiar with. So it takes me a lot longer to read it and to kind of be like, okay, like, like even just, I'm, and I'm getting better at this, but even just looking at the way that like dialogue bubbles work is confusing to me still because I'm still not quite used to the way that that is portrayed and having to like look at somebody's face to tell 
how they're saying something as opposed to having the words like he yelled, you know what I mean? Like stuff like that when you're actually reading like a novel as opposed to a, like a graphic novel or a comic, but I'll get there eventually. <laughs> Yeah, no, that, I mean, that's that's perfectly fair. Um, some people are also mentioning Kingdom Come. Uh, I was going to bring up Kingdom Come also. Uh, Mar Marvel's in Kingdom Come for whatever reason, and, and I think some of it obviously is because of Alex Ross, uh, but those those kind of come to me at the same time, and that also certainly had a, a lot of emotional reson resonance for me. Um, that Superman, there's a lot of pathos there. Because um, I okay, have so Marvels, and I would say that that's probably the one that's gotten me the closest as far as, yeah. like, emotional reactions. I was very invested in this, but I still wasn't like, I mean, I'm the type of person that cries at the drop of a hat. So it's, I'm surprised that I haven't gotten to the, that point yet with a comic and I sure it will happen. I just need to get attached to a character yeah. first and have them die. <laughs> Yeah, well, and Marvels is one of those things that uh, is easily read by pretty much anybody, but you might not, but it, but it might not have exactly that same kind of resonance or as strong of an impact if it's not uh, characters you grew up with, and if you're not, uh, and if you're not really into the history of. The, like the like even the publication history of Marvel, mm -hmm. um, but I have given that to people that have never read a comic book, and uh, and 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 it was and it was uh, impactful to them, which is one of the reasons that I that I gave you that, and that I that I tend to hand that to people. Yeah. Um, somebody asked, and I, I we don't do this regularly because I don't want to be like intentionally super negative. Uh, I mean, not that we won't you know review books we don't like, but just uh, but but somebody said, just out of curiosity, what was the worst book you read this week? Well, what was the worst book you read this week? Oh man, I don't know. I only had yeah. I only had six books. Well, yeah, let's see here. that's rough. I, mean, I didn't read anything terrible. Yeah, me either. Um, uh, this, I mean, like and, and this, I is like, this is like picking my least favorite Pixar movie. Like, I feel awful yeah, when I decide that right. one. <laughs> exactly. Um, I guess Deathstroke, but like, I didn't think it was bad. I just like was a little more confused with it because I'm not familiar with the character. So there you go. <laughs> I mean, for me, it was probably action this week just because I'm sick of how action driven action is low. <laughs> isn't that, isn't that stupid? The book is called action comics and I am complaining about how it's nothing but people hitting each other in the face. That would be like, that would be like if, if I, if I was like, you know what? I'd love this if it wasn't for all the detective work. Probably. Anyway. <laughs> Anyway, um, yeah, sure, folks thanking us for answering their questions. Uh, what else? What else? Uh, Barry Allen, will you and Steve go over Nightfall at any time? It's one of my favorite stories in comics. Uh, yes. Uh, well, I can't promise me and Steve, but Nightfall will happen. Um, de definitely, definitively, and in the not-too-distant future. Uh, Jamie Cook, Cap, you mentioned a while ago maybe doing an introspective video on Superman American Alien. Any plans for that? Thanks for reminding me. Uh, Steve and I had been talking about doing that, and um, getting our schedules to align lately for things has been difficult. So uh, he and I are about to do um, another string of bat chats, and after that we might talk about doing American Alien. I'm, I'm missing one issue of that, so I've got to get my hands on it. Uh... Matt Sci-Fi fan, who do you guys think should play Deathstroke? I don't know. I wish the other guys were here for that question. I asked that in the multi-topic, and the rest of the, the rest of the audience will have better better answers. Um, I really like the guy who plays him on Arrow, and so it's hard for me not to get away from that. Not that I'm saying that he was should, in the Hobbit. I like him. <laughs> not not saying that we should like cast that same actor for a different continuity. I wouldn't do that. But I just beyond that, I don't I don't right off have like a great answer. I don't. They know. were talking about it in in our chat earlier today. I don't remember who brought it up, but it was like Rasco and Eric and Steve. Oh, were they? Maybe Manos. Okay. I don't remember people just because of the video that got tweeted out. See, they probably um, have like opinions and interesting Yeah, they had a thoughts. bunch of people. I don't have thoughts, Lo. Me either. About, about that, unfortunately. Manu Bennett, that's his name. Thank you. Uh... Hey, that's an idea. Ultron32, have you thought about trying to interview Gwenpool writer Christopher Hastings? Yeah, I could shoot him a message. See if he'd be down. I haven't done that in a long time. Um, but uh, that might be fun to have somebody on the show or on uh, GNN. I've been thinking about uh, doing some interviews on Sunday nights and just uh, bringing, or not interviews, but bringing in uh, uh, somebody in the business 
just to talk about whatever our topic is that week with us and to let them plug things. And um, I haven't started doing that yet, but I, I don't know. I've been thinking about it. I haven't, I haven't done any industry interviews regularly in about three or four years. Um, but every now and again, we'll bring somebody on. This is an interesting question, although I think we've sort of discussed it before. The dope, that dope channel wants to know, if given the choice, would you guys reboot the DCEU or not? I'm not ready to respond to that question, Lo. Um, and, like, I get people saying three strikes and you're out and stuff. I still think it's salvageable. Uh, Me too. I mean, it's still going to be a big sore spot that for a lot of us, Again, not dogging anybody's personal opinions about this, but that for a lot of us, you got three mediocre to bad movies in a row, and then maybe they suddenly get good after that. So it'd be weird going back and having to trudge through those if you want to watch the continuity in order. Uh, but I'm not ready to write it off yet. My problem is mostly that of, I... I mean, mostly because, of, because of Affleck. If his Batman movie sucks, that's it. For, you know, I, 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 I really I, like... I, basically all of the casting like even the characters that are ridiculous in my opinion I, like I like the actors and actresses that have been cast for a lot of these things and I think that they deserve um, yeah I don't know I, I think that they deserve the chance to get better stuff to act in um, and not have this be their legacy as the character um, but yeah and and like I already mentioned I I quite enjoyed Suicide Squad. I don't think it was a perfect 10 by any means, but like I liked it a lot more than I've liked the other movies so far. So hopefully this means we're on an upswing and it will just get better. Maybe I'm naive, but that's what I like to think and hope. <laughs> um, yeah. You just, so. you just need the, the right reverence to, behind the penning. Uh, somehow or rather, we know how to cast those movies. I mean, you're absolutely right about that. And so I don't, I certainly don't want to see it rebooted before I get to see what feels like a more real Superman and stuff. Um, you know, now that we know that we're going to get a, 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 another solo Superman movie, I, you know, like Cavill has got to get to play the character that he signed up for. And he's, he's as much as said that, um, that he's kind of, he's kind of waiting for Superman to be Superman. Um, like he's frustrated too. And uh, he's, he, he's, he's good. He just, I mean, not that we've gotten to see him doing a lot yet, but he's proven himself in other things. And um, he, uh, you know, he certainly, he certainly looks and sounds the part. Um, I still can't get around how few words, not even lines, words he has to say in BVS. Um, like we still have the super monosyllabic Superman. Um, even if the, the, the Man of Steel solo sequel is uh, it, like, like is, is a, is a bad story. I hope he gets to talk a lot this time. It'd be nice for him to get to say things. That'd be good. Yeah. Uh, how about one or two more, Lo? Okay. If we see anything interesting. Everybody's just talking about what we just talked about. I know. Um, They're having David, it. David Crabtree um, yeah. just brought out something that I think is definitely... Um, like uh, important to discuss that if Iron Man, Iron Man 2 and the Incredible Hulk have had collectively grossed um, like what the current movies in the DC universe had grossed, would they have asked for a reboot of their cinematic universe? And I think that's interesting uh, just to discuss because those were movies that at least some of them weren't necessarily universally liked and Marvel did have like a larger plan for their universe. Um, so I, I, I get where he's coming from. I do think that DC is in a worse place than Marvel was. Um, so it's hard to compare them, but, I mean, we do all the time between Marvel and DC. I mean, even though I'd yeah, like to there is, stand on their own merits. And this wouldn't have been the case for Marvel then either, but there there is no eventuality. There's no situation where Warner's because of how much they have invested right now, pulls the plug after those three movies and the other movies we know are in production don't happen. Yeah. So if you were to say maybe they need to, uh, uh, you know, they need to pull the plug on all this, uh, you're you're going to get at least three more movies before that would even make any sense. Yeah. You, you see what I'm saying? So like, you know, if we end up with six really mediocre or, or to bad movies, you, you can totally understand why people would be like, I'm kind of sick of, going to the theater and getting burned. 
And so like, I understand why fans would already be saying, man, I kind of wish we could just start over right now. And I think everyone saying that knows it's wishful thinking. That's not going to happen. And I still say, as I said earlier, that there's, you know, there's, uh, there's plenty that can be salvaged here. But I uh, and and I want to see these character these, these actors get to play these characters in better material uh, and in you know uh, you're putting Jeff Johns uh, in in you know you know heading it and having Ben Affleck direct the movie et cetera et cetera um, it seems like we're more on the right track uh, but I I just I also understand why people are frustrated um, mm-hmm. and uh, people don't want to spend their hard earned money on movies that are they're they're maybe liable to not like based on or or think they're liable not to like based on getting burned before just because these are characters they love on the page that aren't being handled in their minds properly. I have another question. If we are yeah. still taking them, um, Barry Allen wants to know yeah, which sure. Netflix shows have you guys been binge watching nonstop besides Daredevil and Stranger Things. He says, right now I'm watching Turn and Penny Dreadful. Have you been watching any other Netflix shows? Well, Not I know- lately. No. The, the big, yeah, the big thing uh, that makes it hard for me is that I've got kids and finding time to binge things without them or that I'm not doing for the channel uh, without the kids around is tough. And nearly everything on Netflix is not kid friendly except for the straight up kid shows. So like, I really want to watch stranger things, but probably not going to do that around the kids. Uh, I, I still haven't watched sense eight for the same reason. Uh, so yeah, there's a number of things I want to sit in and watch, but I have not. I still need to get on sense eight. People keep telling me that I will really like it. So I need to get around to that. Um, I am, pretty much always rewatching Kimmy Schmidt, uh, which I find hilarious. Uh, so that's always one, but for the most part, I don't watch like any, like I don't watch House of Cards. I don't watch Orange is the New Black. My husband watches both, but I don't, um, not, neither of them really interest me that much. Um, and then for the most part beyond that, it's a lot of Marvel shows, which I'm watching because of this. Uh, because, because I, like, I mean, I probably would be watching them anyway, but like even more so I'm like, totally up to date on all of the Marvel shows because of the fact that we review them and stuff. So yeah, I like beyond the Marvel shows, really what I watch is stranger things and Kimmy Schmidt and that's it. <laughs> I like this all caps comment. I uh, dope channel cap finished JLU already for God's sake. Yeah, fair enough. Um, <laughs> we, I, I, I think we were talking primarily about uh, Netflix exclusive shows. Yeah. Uh, and I know that that's there. I also own it on DVD. I just haven't ever finished. I know. I know. There's Bruce Tim stuff that I've not finished. I know. I'll get I'll get there. And I'll try not to be 40 before before that happens. <laughs> Uh, I think that is going to be it for us tonight. Uh, that's been a full hour. Thanks a lot for watching. Sure, appreciate it. Thanks for being here. And Lo and I will be with you again uh, next Monday night, uh, barring any sort of catastrophe or scheduling issues. Um, I'm out of town over the weekend, but I should be back and rearing to go for Monday. Um, Sunday night is still po- is still kind of up in the air for me. Um, we will have the multi-topic extravaganza, or at least a, a GNN. If I'm not there, I don't know if we'll still do multi-topic. Actually, we probably shouldn't do that because I know people want to hear, uh, want, want me to respond to certain things. So I probably won't have multi-topic happen without me. Um, but I've, I got to play it by ear with Sunday night because I might not be back in time. Uh, so anyway, that's the news that's fit to print. Thanks again for watching. Sure, appreciate it. We'll see you again next week. I am Captain Logan. And I'm the Curious Slow. Happy reading, folks. Appreciate you being here. Bye.